Hi guys, it's Reagan and welcome to the start of another reading vlog. This reading vlog is a special one. One, I'm really excited about the TBR and two, it's all about being cozy and getting organized to kick off the new year. I love the month of January. I just feel like the world is my oyster in terms of my life, my TBR. It's just so much fun. And another great thing about this vlog is it's currently raining outside. So I feel like I'm going to get a lot of good reading in over the course of this week, but especially today. But before we dive into the TBR itself for this video, first a word from this video's sponsor, which is Wraith Mark Creative. I'm so excited to be working with Wraith Mark Creative again for this video. If you're not familiar with them, they're best known for creating the most beautiful, stunning limited edition deluxe editions of some of my favorite books out there and i'm so excited to report that the first part of their most ambitious project to date has officially released on kickstarter that's right they have been working directly with ve schwab to create deluxe editions of the shades of magic series with the first book a darker shade of magic now officially available via kickstarter and there's so many exciting aspects of this project including that every single copy of this book will be signed by the author which i personally can't wait to collect as the shades of of magic series is one of my personal favorite fantasy series out there but a little more information about this stunning deluxe edition first and foremost there is stunning art created by rovina kai for the front cover as well as full wrapped illustrations for the hardcover case as well the dust jacket is also going to be embossed and foiled with matching gilding on the pages itself as well as a ribbon bookmark to easily track your progress through this stunning edition but don't worry the inside of this edition is just as stunning as the outside with incredible full colored end sheets done by Felix Ortiz as well as a ton of interior illustrations to enjoy throughout the entire story with even more illustrations potentially unlocked if the Kickstarter is able to hit a variety of different stretch goals. The book itself has been completely custom crafted for this project everything from the covers to the chapter headers and section breaks and you can just tell by looking at this thing that it's not only beautiful but crafted with so much thought and care and I really just love how closely Wraithmark Creative worked with V.E. Schwab to bring this project to life. I will of course have a link down below to the Kickstarter for this campaign. If you want to take a closer look at the illustrations or just get more information on this project, it's truly stunning. And I personally can't wait to have this book grace my own shelves. But again, big shout out to Wraithmark Creative for sponsoring this video. But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive back into the vlog. So my TBR for this video is actually rather ambitious. And that is to complete my reread of Gideon the Ninth and then start and hopefully finish Haro the Ninth. I have a long history with this series of basically starting it and then never actually actually continuing on past book one. But the other funny thing about this very beloved and popular series is that I really have enjoyed what I have read so far. So the first book is Gideon the Ninth, which I have read in its entirety a few years ago. And then early last year, I actually started a reread of this. I thought I actually finished it. But when I pulled this book off my shelf to prep for this video, I realized I actually only got to page like 150. So there and then I decided let's finish this reread so I can finally get to my read of Haro the Ninth by Tom Zinmuir, which I have been meaning to read for the longest time, but continually forget everything and then kind of start back at the beginning. But I'm finally breaking the cycle with this vlog because I'm gonna finish my reread of Gideon the Ninth and I'm gonna start and hopefully finish Haro the Ninth as well. I would describe this series as like a fantasy sci-fi mixture. It's also incredibly unique, both in its genre combination and also just its literary style. And we're introduced to our main character, Gideon the Ninth, and she has been trying to get off her home planet her entire life called Ninth House. But Gideon has been prevented leaving this planet her entire life by her nemesis, Haro. At the beginning of the book, these two characters basically make an alliance because Haro, who's kind of the leader of this planet, is invited as an emissary to this other planet where all the representatives from every single planet in this necromancy world are arriving. And then from there, the story sort of turns into this closed door murder mystery competition story. In my reread of the first one, that's kind of where I'm at. Introduced to Gideon, she begins her training as like the sword companion of Haro. They travel to this place and so begins like the mystery surrounding the necromancy of this particular location. There's basically one powerful political member and a sword companion from every uh, planet and house within this world. And every planet and house also has their own necromancy style. And a mystery really begins to reveal itself. The writing style is also incredibly unique. Like there's a lot of banter and humor in this. I've read it and also have listened to the audiobook in the past. Also say this world is very, very detailed, which is why I constantly find myself reading it when I want to continue on with the rest of the series because I don't want to miss details. But here we are. That was the longest intro ever to open up the reread and continuation 
of this very beloved series that I'm excited to document with you guys over the course of this week. But yeah, welcome to the vlog. I'm literally going to sit down right now and get some reading in and I will keep y'all posted. I already know I like Gideon the Ninth, so that should be fun. And I'm finally looking forward to getting to Harrow the Ninth as well. Look at this beautiful gloomy day and our gutters are no longer full of leaves. So that's fantastic news. Matilda's also really enjoying her day, catching up on her sleep. Sleep is a big in for Matilda in 2024, you know? I won't lie, the rain and perhaps just the fact that you know, we're just after the holiday season, I'm struggling a bit, I'm really tired. So I'm gonna make some coffee to enjoy while reading, which I think is very necessary. I also think a big task for this week, which I wanna do is finish putting away the holiday decor. It's basically done. Um, but I have like a few big things left, so that is also on the docket for this week too. So, coffee first. Ah! Getting coffee everywhere. If you're wondering the big holiday task I have left, it's the Christmas tree. But like everything else is pretty much put away, all the other rooms, but the Christmas tree needs to be done and then the mantle. It is absolutely pouring down rain outside, which I'm truly thriving in. I'm loving this weather so much, but I've also sat down and jumped back into Getting the Night by Tom Zemir. I read another 50 pages, which means I'm at the 200 page mark. I just love this book and story so much. I need to persist and just continue to read it and get not keep getting tracked into just reading book one over and over again. But lucky for me, book one is so good. It's such a perfect combination of humor that's actually funny in terms of the narrative back and forth between our two main characters, a really fascinating magic system, a compelling like mystery plot line, and just a world that this book is set in that's all interesting. Like there's so many positive things about the experience of this that are just working for me. In this sci-fi fantasy world there are different planets with different ruling families that also have their own version of like necromancy. At the beginning of this book though Haro and Gideon basically make a pact. Gideon becomes Haro's swords person or like cavalier and goes with them to attend this like summit meeting between all of the planets, all the different houses as they are collected together by like this really powerful ruling body. And they're brought to this house for mysterious unknown reasons. It's really raining now. <laughs> that initially seem really benign and like more political but it quickly turns more sinister and deadly along the way there's also like necromancy based investigation and mystery too and you just meet all of these characters you don't know who to trust and the back and forth between gideon and haro is just hilarious they hate each other but they also begrudgingly begin to respect one another there's a lot of humor there there's a lot of hate that could possibly turn into something more. This setting of this confined house, which Gideon and Haro travel to, is just a really fascinating one. It has so many mysteries to unlock, like physically within the house, but then also like the people that live and work there too. There's just a lot of things that make this book really captivating and the character connections are also just great. Where I'm at now, which is about 50% of the way through, a little under 50%, the mystery is really starting to heat up. Been introduced to Haro and Gideon and their dynamic. Then we see them again in a new scenario where they're introduced to all of these characters that are all very, very different, uh, like socially, politically, as they're all existing on this new, like far away house and planet where they have to interact with one another. So those social dynamics have been interesting to unpack. But now the competition and the mystery has turned, has taken a direction where things have gotten a lot more dangerous and like. The unease about who to trust has really shifted too and that's kind of where I'm at at this point and I'm just so hooked with this mystery and I just really enjoy the narrative style. I have listened to the audiobook of this in the past or parts of this book via audio in the past and it does work really well because I feel like a large strength of this book is the narrative quality of the story like the dialogue um, but anyway I'm rambling on. I read 50 pages. I immediately fell back into this book. I just love Gideon and Haro, I love these characters are surrounded by and the mystery of it. It's like, it's combining a lot of my favorite things from different genres and it just works so well, you know? But anyway, I think I'm gonna go watch some reality TV and play Zelda Tears of the Kingdom as I do. But I'm definitely gonna read a lot more of this tonight because obviously I wanna stay on track and read Haro the Ninth as well. And I'm gonna enjoy this rain because it's pouring outside, pouring. Pouring. Hello, hello, hello. A rainy night means obviously a leftovers night. 
have my very non-traditional Korean style pot roast I made the other night. I'm also going to heat up or cook up some zucchini as well, but this should be pretty delicious if I do say so myself. And I have rice here. And dinner is served. We have as a family started a fantastic anime. So uh, it also has a really fantastic outro. No, Christmas might be over, but Christmas cookie consumption is not over. Gang's all here, the fireplace is on, and I'm about to get a fantastic reading session in of Gideon the Ninth, because obviously we're trying to get a lot of reading accomplished for this vlog. Jujutsu Kaisen is also fantastic. I definitely started that anime right when it came out and then fell off, which I'm not even sure totally why, because I really liked it when I started it, but I'm happy to be back. It's also really fun to watch with Clay, and now that there's like three seasons, I think, to be able to watch too, which is also great, you know, more episodes to enjoy right off the bat. But now I'm gonna focus on getting the ninth. Good morning, everyone, on this very gloomy morning, my favorite types of morning, I'm going to sit down and do more reading. I made some excellent progress on getting the ninth yesterday, which I feel very good about. We gotta stay focused, we got, ooh, spilling coffee everywhere. But we gotta stay focused and determined. I have a lot of pages to read, I'm realizing. And I forget how slow I read getting the ninth, but that's okay. Hi friends. It is in fact later in the day than I wish it was for me to make a reading update, but we're here. It's fine. Um, I have uh, passed the 300 page mark of Gideon in the Ninth and I love this stupid book. This is literally my third time reading it basically. And it's just so entertaining. And I'm shocked with every twist and turn. Like it's the first time I've ever read it. This book does take me a bit to read. I think because the dialogue is so fast that I feel like I really have to pay attention because context, world building, explanation for all the magic works can just be like mentioned briefly and then moved on very, very quickly. But I think the style of the writing is partly why I think it's so fun to read. Like the humor, the rompiness of it, but the, the seriousness and the intensity of it too. It's such an interesting mix of things and it just works really well for me personally. Things are also getting really intense and I just love the setting of this book. Obviously Gideon and Harrowhawk are in this weird house that's like a crumbling manor on First House and they're there um, invited by like the Emperor Necromancer to compete against each other to become a Lysiter, which is some type of powerful political position. And you're like, cool, cool, cool. They're there, they'll compete against one another. You meet everyone from all the other houses. People begin to kind of work in pairs, try to discover these keys to unlock literal secrets that are hiding within this house. But slowly and then all at once, things become sinister and it becomes very intense. And like my heart is breaking left and right. You see people have to make alliances. You're not quite sure who to trust. The mystery of this place is just so palpable. And I'm just like trying to understand what's happening and like how quick the plot moves. And I mean, in the way that like sudden things will happen and you'll just be left shock and like rattled just like the characters. And you're trying to pick up the pieces while still trying to figure out one, the mystery of this place, but also like hoping people are just gonna survive. It has this like, and then there were none vibes to it, but it's so sci-fi that it just works so well. And like, I also just love reading with Gideon through this book because of her humor and just how she interprets and interacts with people is really funny. And the developing relationship between her and Haro is also really interesting. They're in this pressure cooker of a situation where they hate each other or they hated each other, but now one, they're really, the only people they can fully trust. And they also understand each other in ways that other people just won't be able to know because they're from the same place. They have the same background in some aspects. So I just feel like they, you know, who knows you better than your arch nemesis basically. So like that's sort of the situation. I am so compelled by other characters in this place too. Like I like people and I'm like, are they going to betray me though? It's just so good. And all of this alongside the necromancy and the magic system is so interesting. The necromancy in this is like kind of scientific-y, like everyone has their own specialty of necromancy and it has a sort of magical element to it, but there does appear to be this like mad scientist research, um, like theory based aspect to how necromancy works, which I also like. So it's kind of like this mad scientist, um, element to it and they're kind of like forcing these very 
And to try to get these keys to unlock the secrets, they have to take on like various trials, which also expands their knowledge on certain like necromantic specialties, if you will. But yeah, I only have 150 pages of this book left. It's so wild. It's so wild. And I'm just, I'm having a great time. So I'm going to read more now, actually. Surprise, surprise. And uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Truly. Decided to take it easy tonight. And I grabbed, we got some chicken fingers for dinner. And this is an entire container of ranch. God bless. Gonna go watch 90 Day Fiance. Hello friends, I'm in bed. It's a bit later than I was anticipating. I downloaded a new cozy game tonight called Unpacking because it was on sale and you literally, just as the name sounds, unpack boxes and like place items in various rooms. And it's so absorbing and like charming. I wish I was that clean and organized in my real life, but you know, in a virtual world, I will take it. Now I'm settled into bed and I am going to hopefully finish Gideon the Ninth. I only have about a hundred pages of this book left and things are just happening, 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 happening. Um, I feel like this is the fastest I've read this book. Maybe because it's, you know, I've established multiple times in this vlog. It's not the first time I picked this book up, but um, anyway, I'm so excited. I'm hoping to start Haro the Ninth tomorrow and I really feel like I'll have surpassed a hurdle in my life. Hello, good morning. I have a reading update for you guys. First and foremost, I finished Gideon the Ninth. This book is so explosive. Reveal after reveal. Finally sort of piecing together who, what, where, and why is just incredibly satisfying. Also, I just have to give a shout out to the slow build in the relationship between Haro and Gideon. I really appreciate that the author took their time kind of building the momentum here and I think it worked really well and also had great plot payoff too when we kind of were reaching the pinnacle the the plot climax if you will I also really um gotta give a shout out to the combat writing in this a lot of this book is more about like experimental and trial based uh necromantic approach if you will but everything sort of hits the fan near the end and there is quite a bit of combat in this book and it's both chaotic and wild to read because of how fighting works in this world because so much of it is centered on like growing bones if you will um but yeah overall really enjoyed my reread of getting the ninth and i feel like i've reached a point where i no longer need to reread this book at least for a long while but i really liked it i might have even liked it more the third time i read it than the first time i read it which i don't really know what that says about me but just like the humor the action, the mystery. It was a very like isolated story. Like most of this story was contained to like one singular location, which is interesting, especially because I have officially started book two and I have a feeling this book is going to not be so isolated, but I could be wrong. And also an interesting change is this main character of Gideon the Ninth, as you would imagine, is Gideon the Ninth. We know Haro. We obviously interact with other characters within this book, but primarily we are consuming the story following Gideon and discovering things as Gideon discovers things, if that makes sense. This book is a change because we're following Haro as our main character. And after the events of the first book, it's a very interesting pivot. And I have already started it. And I'm very surprised at the, let's just say, tone where we're finding Haro at the beginning of this book. It's going to be, I feel like, a very interesting journey. There's also quite a bit of reveals at the end of Gideon the Ninth, both like politically how this world works. We got more insight on this like emperor figure who was introduced to us at the very beginning of the story. And I just feel like the world is going to be cracked open a bit more, which I think will be very interesting to explore. But there's also like a lot of stuff that happened at the end of Gideon the Ninth. And I'm like, how is that going to impact this book. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot. My curiosity is like pulled in all different types of directions and I feel like the author is going to really make me wait for it and uh, there's quite a bit left to consume. But officially I have read 300 pages of Getting in the Ninth and I've also read 50 pages of Haro the Ninth which really throws you into <laughs> this book. Like it's interesting. Like the story opens like a countdown like the day before a huge event and then we like cut to 14 months before this huge event then nine months before this huge event so you're like what is happening but i love feeling confused if i'm being honest but look folks i have done it i finally have started the sequel to this series i've moved on past gideon the ninth and i could not be more proud 
and I'm, and I'm enjoying it. So cheers to that. It's one of those days where instant ramen is the only acceptable lunch. Hello friends. I have been reading this AM. I need to get dressed and ready for the day, but instead I've just been reading Fire of the Ninth, and I have read officially 100 pages of this second book, and it's really interesting. It definitely threw me for a loop initially. Like, starting this book is very confusing, but I would also argue getting the Ninth is kind of confusing initially. Like, getting settled into the narrative style of getting the Ninth took me a minute. And these books are definitely like sister books, but they're also different. Like, they're uniquely confusing in their own way, but there's like a consistent concept that Tasma Muir is using in her like plot structure, I guess, if that makes sense. So obviously this book is following Haro. And when you start this book, you immediately are like, what is going on? Like something with Haro as the character seems off. Um, you're also just kind of like thrown headfirst into the plot. And there's kind of like a countdown backwards. But even when you like reach present day to watch the story unfold now linearly, it's still confusing because like you don't understand why Haro is the way Haro is in this book. Like there's characters surrounding Haro, which makes sense to you based off of the very explosive end of Gideon the Ninth. But you're also just like, huh, I'm confused. Haro's confused. So you sort of, at least I started this book just being like kind of confused. And I didn't know if it was like a me issue or I'm supposed to be confused, but I'm pretty sure you're supposed to be confused. And what I've come to realize and what I'm really enjoying with this book uh, is that there's a new conspiracy at play. And I would say the author, uh, Tom Zinmuir, likes to make her readers confused in a way that I personally enjoy. Like Gideon the Ninth was an unusual reading experience. Um, you're thrown into this house surrounded by all of these people. There's some sort of competition, but there's this conspiracy. You don't really know what the political position everyone is fighting for really means. You don't really know how you're supposed to get there. You don't really know who you can trust, but you know there's a mystery and you're like trying to solve it alongside all of your characters. In this book, there's a new conspiracy given to us, but the style of conspiracy is different, but it's like a similar reading experience as a reader of just being confused and like trying to piece things together. And once you sort of realize like, okay, there's something at play here, it begins to recolor every scene that you've already read and also begins to color every scene you begin to read because it's like something is off. And then you start to realize it's like a picture you were expecting but then the longer you look at it like everything is slightly out of place and you're like wait a second here so like you're reading what's going on but you're also reading between the lines of what's going on and it's just very interesting and it's hooked me quite a bit the scale of this book seems to be much larger like we are traveling to a whole nother location which i appreciate because obviously the first book was like in a very isolated situation but i think the style of conspiracy or the fact that there is a conspiracy is staying consistent just the just the type of conspiracy has changed, but everything is still connected to this like uh, undying emperor that's controlling the empire and like even kicked off the competition in getting the night to begin with, you know what I mean? But yeah, first 100 pages has been an experience. I have like reread scenes already. It's definitely not the easiest thing to follow, but I appreciate how I feel like the author is like playing with me a little bit. I respect it, you know? It's Friday. I've also changed into sweatpants and I'm putting on my apron because it's Friday and that means I deserve, well, I don't need to deserve it. I just want a sweet treat. And I don't care that Christmas is over, folks. We're making hot chocolate. And I've actually been on a hot chocolate hiatus for about five days. So I feel like I'm really due for a hot chocolate. So let's get all of our ingredients together. Milk, vanilla, brown sugar and chocolate chips. And I am gonna put a shot of espresso in this. And I feel like I need to be nice and energized tonight because tonight is the night that Clay and I are officially taking down the tree. I feel like I've really been putting that off, but it's like the last thing I need to do. So we're gonna take it all down. We don't have a pre-lit tree. And I think that's why I always dread it because unwinding all the lights, it's really, it's never as bad as I think it's going to be. So anyway. Got my milk in. Uh, we don't have, I really don't have whipped cream. I'm gonna have to have whipped creamless hot chocolate, which is okay. I can make, no, I don't have heavy whipping cream. I don't have any, I don't have anything to fix it. It just is what it is. 
It is what it is. I'm gonna use a whisk. Which looks dreadful sound. Hot chocolate. Actually a hot mocha, because I did put a shot of espresso in here, which does not only make the chocolate taste more chocolatey, but it also makes me less sleepy. Anyway, I'm going to go drink this and also read Harl Hark the Night, which I am so excited about. Dinner is in progress. We're making a quick, easy, clear the fridge out kind of dinner tonight. It's a stir fry. I have chicken marinating in this bag that looks very unappealing. And then I also chopped up some onion, carrots, and broccoli, which again is what I had, and uh, Japanese barbecue sauce. I buy this often from Costco. It tastes really good. So I'm letting the rice cook for a bit. In the meantime, we're gonna tackle that tree. And then I'm definitely gonna be doing more reading tonight because Haro the Ninth is so good. It's different than Gideon the Ninth, but they still feel like, it's refreshing to read a book that feels so different than the first one, but it's still cohesively in my mind, like they make sense together. And because it's also centering a different main character, it makes sense that they would be different. And I appreciate that quite a bit, but yeah. Gonna be a cozy night in tonight for sure. Cleaning, it's the last of the Christmas decorations. They're going away. worst part about putting Christmas decorations away is <laughs> organizing the lights. And dinner yes. is served. Oh, I'm sorry. Is served! <laughs> <laughs> Fell to the internet hype and we watched Salt Burn tonight. Clay finally convinced me to watch a movie. <laughs> so, I can officially say I'm about halfway through Haro the Ninth and this is such a wild reading experience. I would say I can understand how some people perhaps would struggle reading Gideon the Ninth and then going into Haro the Ninth because in a lot of ways the books feel stylistically, mood-wise especially, very different from one another. This book is also even more, I don't want to use the word confusing because it's purposely confusing, but like very twisty in its narrative style than Gideon the Ninth. Like I feel like I have to like really pay attention to what's going on or I find myself easily lost within the narrative. Um, but all I have to say is I'm really liking this book and I'm also eternally grateful that I just again reread Gideon the Ninth going into Haro the Ninth because I feel like if I had a significant gap between those two books, I would be even more lost than, I'm not really lost, but I would be lost I think if I picked this book up after a long break of Gideon the Ninth. So many positive things to say about this reading experience. First and foremost, I would say the tone of this book. So Gideon the Ninth has this sort of humor, rompiness, over the top narrative style quality, particularly with the dialogue surrounding one of our main characters. That is in stark contrast to the experience of Haro the Ninth. This book is so reserved and so opposite of that, if I'm being honest, that I think it helps to really emphasize this feeling of wrongness that not only Haro has in this book, but us, the reader, like something is so wrong, something is so off, but we don't 
fully know, like we know we are experiencing a lot of off things, but you're like, how did we get to this point? I have no idea. And the wild thing about this is as a reader, we know something is off, but our main character Haro knows something's off and she doesn't really know what it is either. But as a reader, we're also experiencing this Haro that I would say is like 20% of her normal self. Um, and it's just really wild. Also, one of the reasons why I'm really happy that I read Getting the Knife before this book is that we have our like current plot line, our current present day chapters, if you will, where we're basically watching Haro kind of go into this next step as a necromancer. She's surrounded by a lot of new people, some of, some of which we met in the last book. Um, some of them are very new and introduced to us at the end of the last book. Um, and there's this sort of like ever looming conflict that's coming that is like a really difficult and dangerous situation. And Haro is trying to like harness um, elements of herself to like participate in this, which you know, makes sense. But alongside those chapters, which are very strange, <laughs> very dangerous, um, we also have chapters of everything that happened in Giddy in the Ninth. But you quickly realize as a reader that this isn't how you remembered Giddy in the Ninth going. And that's kind of like the theme of this book, like Haro in this book, like something has changed where the narrative and the story has changed. And we don't quite know who to trust. Like Thomson Muir has made Haro an unreliable narrator to herself and to us in a way to kind of drive this plot forward. And we're constantly just like re encountering situations or plots that we've already read before and entirely different iterations of them. And you're like, what, what? Um, and it just makes for a very like mind boggling time. And again, I think this kind of goes to how Thomas and Muir really likes to play with conspiracy. She did that in Getting the Ninth in a very distinct way. And I really appreciate that she's continuing to mess with conspiracy in this next book, but in an entirely different fashion, which keeps the whole thing fresh. Like stylistically, these books feel so different, like in the way that she's writing them, not in like the writing style of the world building, but like the voice, I would say but that difference also makes them work so well together in a way that I just really appreciate. Like, this is a very unique reading experience and one that's convoluted that I will say some readers just simply might not enjoy. I love feeling confused and like trying to piece things together within a fantasy world and setting. Thomas and Muir does not hold your hand with the magic system, her explaining how the magic works, her explaining like really intense situations that sort of happen at the drop of a hat. I'm constantly finding myself having to go back and like reread segments of this book that I've already read to try to just like make sure I'm following everything. I also feel like this will be a very interesting book to reread because I feel like once everything comes together, you'll feel all the pieces there all along, but there's like no way, at least my little, my tiny little brain could have pieced that together beforehand. But I'm just like really hooked on this. It's just such a, I don't know. It just feels like such a cool reading experience that's working. And I'm curious if like stylistically every book, cause it kind of centers a new character, um, will have this sort of change, but I really appreciate it. It's so weird. Also just like her concepts of like gods and these almighty beings as they exist within this isolated situation. It, she's also giving us another very isolated living experience with very powerful beings, just like getting the night, just a different one, um, which just creates some very wild times. And I think she can really focus on the characters because there's just not this like large world that we're moving through. Um, but yeah, it's wild. It's taking me so long to read half of this book, but I am really enjoying this book, but it's interesting to say the least. I'm really appreciating it, but I feel like this is gonna take me a while. And this book is like 500 pages. So again, 250 pages read, success, but this has taken me so long. <laughs> it's the weekend, which can only mean one thing, a delicious breakfast. So I have bacon in the oven cooking. So I'm going to make some eggs. I'm like squatting to be in frame. So I'm going to make some eggs. I'm going to keep it simple. Just some eggs and some toast. I do have cinnamon rolls, but I decided I'll squat. I decided that I'm going to make this as a mid afternoon treat. So like an extended breakfast throughout the day. And then I have leftovers to make for dinner, which should be delicious. And breakfast. Ooh. 
and the toast is even done. It's served. Final reading sprint of this book before I have to wrap up this vlog. There's Miss Matilda tomorrow morning, but uh, let's see how far I can get. I'm definitely obviously gonna finish this book this month, but I do weekly reading vlogs, so I'm gonna have to pivot soon, but this book is so good. <laughs> Hi guys, and welcome to the end of the vlog, the next day. And I'm happy to report I have made some excellent progress into the Locked Tomb series by Thames and Muir. And I also feel like this series is catapulted at the top of my TBR. I loved Gideon the Ninth, but I can honestly say, and while I have not quite finished Harrow the Ninth yet, I only have about 100 pages of this book left. I'm liking Harrow the Ninth even more than the first one, which I like so much. I have literally read three times. Where I'm at within this book with 100 pages left, things are slowly beginning to reveal themselves, but I will say there have been little crumbs along the way that have just made this narrative so intoxicating. I am so confused, but confused in the way that I love so much. And when Tom Zimmer gives us a little bit of something, character reference or a run in with someone we weren't anticipating or even an unlikely turn of phrase, I feel like I'm on the edge of my seat, absolutely eating it up. And the reason why I'm so hooked is how Tom Zimmer put this story together. I don't know if I can trust myself, my interpretation of the characters that I am surrounded with, who I should like, who I should not like, what is happening, who is good, who is bad. And that confusion has just been so good like it's made me hooked within this reading these 400 pages which i have read took me forever as i've mentioned a few times because i have just so carefully plotted myself through this book agonizing over every sentence and word i also feel like there's been quite a bit of like lore building within this um again we're in another very isolated setting uh similar to getting the ninth where our characters are kind of thrown into a larger problem they're trying to work out and they're also training but because of the setting we're in and the characters we find our main character haro surrounded by we get a lot more information about like the founding of this world which is a very unusual world this necromantic world with different planets with different houses that exist on these planets we get a bit of insight in like the founding reality of this sci-fi setting, which has just been so good. But also it's not been so much information where I'm like, okay, I can tell you what's gonna happen next. I can guess what's happening. I can guess what's going on. No, there's no guessing here. I just feel, I feel grateful when Tom Zinmir throws me a bone, if you will, ha 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 ha, my way in terms of like kind of explaining this plot, the characters, the world, and it's just been so, much fun. I have had a blast reading these two books and I can highly recommend this series so much. And I want to read, I want to finish this, which I plan to finish probably very, very soon. And also get to the third book very, very soon because I will say this is a very detail oriented series. And I am someone who forgets details. So I need to keep the momentum going in terms of the Locked Tomb series before I forget stuff. But I really like it. I love the character dynamics, just the concept, like everything about it has been so gripping. I had a blast. I'd highly recommend these two books and I'm so happy we finally got to Haro the Ninth. I'm so happy. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Again, big shout out to this video sponsor, which is Wraith Mark Creative. Again, I'll have a link down to their Kickstarter for A Darker Shade of Magic down below. But thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon with another video soon. Goodbye.